Um, what I'd like to do is spend some time uh, uh, talking about building uh, a CDN with uh, Apache Traffic Server. Uh, so this is based on experiences that, um, that we have at Comcast um, building this CDN. Um, a little bit um, about me. Uh, I am an engineer at Comcast Cable. I um, am the lead engineer of our CDN engineering group. And I am in NEDO VSS CDN, CDNing, which means I'm in the video services group. Um, I um, have been a long time um, interactive TV geek. I've been probably doing television type stuff uh, for the last 18 years now. Um, and I um, am a recovering Unix sysadmin. I don't think you ever leave that. Once you've been one, you always will be a Unix sysadmin. I try and solve everything in Perl. It doesn't always work, but I, I still kind of have to do that. Um, and I'm, uh, I live in Colorado, but I'm originally from the Netherlands, as uh, you may have guessed from my uh, name. Jan is a very common name out there. Um, a disclaimer, there's a lot of talk about Comcast and what we do, and a lot of people looking at us, and we're buying Time Warner, and there's all this stuff going on. Um, we use CDNs in many, many ways. The CDN I'm going to be talking about is the CDN, the next generation CDN that we use to deliver next generation video to our own customers. And you can take all kinds of little details in this presentation and say, well, is Comcast doing this? Is Comcast doing that? I hope you guys are not going to be doing that because that, that's just going to get really, really messy. Um, this is about the CDN that we build to deliver video. Um, a little bit about what, what really is a CDN, because you have this HTTP uh, caching proxy, and what do you need to make that into a CDN? Obviously, you need a lot of these caches, because that, they're really the workhorses of any CDN. Um, but you also need a way to get your customers to the closest cache that you have in a location. It's, it's, it's all about trying to sort of get these caches deep into the network and not have this, this traffic go up in your network, but trying to localize it as, as, as best as possible. Um, and, we, and we call this thing that, that does that, that helps you get to the closest cache, we call that the content router. It's, it's maybe a, a strange term for a lot of people, but we call that content routing. It's not necessarily, we're not really routing a content, we're getting the customer to the closest cache, but it has the effect of actually routing content through our network as well. Um, we, um, we need a health protocol to see how our caches are doing. Um, you don't want to be sending customers to, try to caches that are uh, broken, that are overloaded, or things like that. Um, you need a management and monitoring system. A CDN is kind of this whole package of all of these things. We have hundreds of these caches. You can't, you know, tell that or SSH to all of them and do configuration. You need some kind of management system. And you need a reporting system. Um, CDNs, it's really important for CDNs to be able to show what they've been doing. Sometimes there's internal or external billing that's based on log uh, formats and, and log lines. And it sort of is kind of the, it's, it's how you uh, do accounting. Of, of a CDN. Um, now, why does Comcast need one? And why does Comcast specifically need this, uh, this CDN? Um, we're, we're sort of in this, this transition of, of having, you know, we have a lot of legacy video out there. We do a lot of legacy delivery of video um, right now. But we're moving towards a newer way of delivering video. We're moving towards a newer way of discovering video. I don't know if some of you may have seen our new X1, X2 interface. It doesn't look any, like it was made in the 90s anymore. It looks like it's a web style interface on your TV that allows you to discover all kinds of uh, video, all kinds of assets. Um, we have all kinds of web style images that we need to get to those set top boxes. And once you start talking set top boxes, you're easily talking millions and millions. And when you start ramping up, there's a lot of traffic that they can be making. Um, but more importantly, uh, next generation video is also becoming all the way IP. It, it's currently, when we deliver IP to your set-top box, mostly what happens is, is it's multicast in our, video, in our core network. At about the last mile, we convert that to what we call QAM in cable speak. And um, 
and it, it, it's, it's a proprietary protocol from there. It's not necessarily proprietary, but it's very cable stuff, if you know what I mean. We're moving to a way of delivering video to end users, all the way to end users. That is not that anymore. That's actually using IP. This happened to voice in 2000, between 95 and 2000. Right now, if you pick up your phone, it doesn't matter if you're on uh, a, a traditional POTS phone provider or if you're on Comcast or if you're on your cell phone. That voice signal is actually traveling across IP. It's actually IP packets. The same is going to happen to, uh, to video. Um, and this is, this is kind of important because this is mostly what, what we carry on our CDN and mostly what we build our CDN to. What happens is you have these big video files. Everybody's downloaded these big old .ts files that you can play, and it takes a very long time. To deliver these to our customers, and Netflix does this, Hulu, uh, Amazon, everybody does sort of the same thing. There's three major protocols to do this. But what you do is you take these big files and you chop them up in two second, three seconds, or six second chunks. And you deliver those chunks using HTTP, same HTTP that you use to browse to LinkedIn or to Facebook, or it's the same protocol, same everything. And now these objects become kind of opaque things that you can do what you do with other web objects as well. You can store them in a CDN, you can um, date them, you can give them a max age, you can do all the things that you did before with web pages, you can now do that to video. Um, it still is quite high bandwidth though, because um, you know, you're talking easily four, five, six megabits per second that we want to be delivering to your laptop. And if we're going um, big screen TV, you're talking seven, eight megabits per second, and sometimes even more if you, and then they start doing 4K, and you get all these other things. It's sort of a rat race, but it's very high bit weight compared to um, what, what we were talking, um, what, what a normal browser would be using. Um, it's also, um, we use it for live television and for, uh, for VOD and cloud DVR. Um, so we, we, um, we have live events that are going on. NBC was doing the Olympics. Um, all of that stuff was using this type of technology. And it also sort of adapts to what resources you have in the network between you and the CDN and on your local laptop. I don't know if you guys knew, use Netflix, but usually when you start a Netflix movie, you can see it's kind of fuzzy a little bit. And then after two, six, depending on what kind of connectivity you have, it actually ramps up to a higher bit rate. And we call that uh, ABR video, adjustable, adjustable bit rate video. Um, so about two years ago, we asked Comcast, we're going to heavily invest into this technology. We wanted to use this technology to start delivering to second screens, but also to primary screen uh, TVs. And we kind of had a decision to make back then. Um, and we could go and buy this. There's vendors out there. Um, there's large vendors out there. Uh, Cisco is one. Um, Veraview is another. Alcatel, Lucent. You could go and buy this and get the technology from a vendor, get support, get all this good stuff that cable companies know and love and really, really sort of that's what we do, right? We're cable companies. We go to a vendor. We give them money. They give us a product. And when it doesn't work, we call them. And then if it really doesn't work, then we have our boss call them. And it's not even worse. And you know, that's sort of how cable used to work. But I think Comcast as a company is sort of transitioning from that old guide with the blue wieners and all that old stuff that was built in the 90s where it takes us, what, six, seven months to get a release out on a, on a set-top box to this newer world where we have, you know, um, fast release of software for our X1 platform. We do it every month, I think. We go in Agile. We're moving to uh, MPEG-4. We're moving to all kinds of newer technologies. And Comcast is really sort of going into a new direction and my team and our, the thing that we built, I think, is, is sort of spearheading that transformation inside Comcast. Um, so we decided to do it ourselves. And we said, we're going to build this thing ourselves. And we're going to step back and, and sort of say, OK, what do, what do we want to do? What are the most important things? Now, being an old, old cable guy like I am, 
The two most important things are you don't want to get locked into a vendor. You don't want to get locked into a vendor. And actually, the third thing is you don't want to get locked into a vendor. Because that is how cable used to be. You would, and, and it's the same for CDNs. There are CDN products out there. Even though HTTP 1.1 is an open spec and everything that travels on that CDN is totally open, the control plane, what makes it, what gets your customer to these, these local caches, what, ha what has what have caches talking to each other, what manages these caches, is completely locked in. So if I go to Cisco and I buy one cache for 10 gigabits per second, I put it in one location. If I want to expand on that, I got to go to Cisco again and buy it again. That was the most important reason why we didn't want to go this route and why we, why we spent the time and energy to go this route. Obviously, we wanted it to be cost effective. Um, I think it is, uh, I, I'm not going to go into a lot of details there, but we are a lot more cost effective than some of the vendor pricing out there. Um, we wanted everything to be IPv6 and IPv4 from the get-go. I know this is 2014 and IPv6 has been around for a long, long time, but you would be amazed how many products are out there that are not IPv6 yet because it's just not needed enough. We said this, this thing is going to be IPv6 from the get-go. We don't want it to be doing this half-half, so we, we are both. We wanted it to be horizontally scalable. Everybody wants that, but we really wanted to sort of build something that we can keep adding capacity to it and not have to worry about you know, some choke points and things like that. Um, we wanted it to work really, really well for this AVR video thing, but we didn't exclusively want to build it for that. Um, and, and, and I think our CDN currently is, is sort of becoming almost like a mosh pit. I don't know that there's any product that our product engineering or business people are coming up with that doesn't in some way or shape or form actually needs content delivery across HTTP. Everything seems to be going that way, and we want it to be ready for that as well. But we want to optimize it for this video product. That's our core product as Comcast. So we want to really optimize it for that. Um, um, I, I, I used to work for somebody who ingrained this in me that you do not want state if you can prevent it. So we wanted to not have state. We wanted everything to sort of be loosely coupled. We didn't want to have you know, clustering technology, for instance. We were very, very shy of, of doing clustering, even though some, some caches have clustering technologies. Very shy of that because it, it gets really complex really fast. So we didn't want to do that. Um, we wanted to have 100% of availability, meaning that it used to be in cable that at 2 a.m. there's a maintenance window and you pull the switch and you go and screw a new card in or you do all kinds of maintenance stuff. We want maintenance to be part of normal life. We want, if we add a cache, if something breaks, if something fails, everything should just route around it and customers shouldn't know. Nobody should be in, 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 in a stressed state because they have to do maintenance on anything. It should just be a normal thing of life. That's, wh that's what we do. Um, so that, th those, and it should be simple. Those were sort of the design principles that we have. So here's um, what we came up with. Um, I'll go into the caches and the content routing a little bit more in, 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 uh, in detail, um, but we chose traffic server. I'll go, go, go into that a little bit as well. Um, the health protocol is something that we built in-house. It's an Apache Tomcat application that monitors all these ATS caches. What we do is every eight seconds, we pull a modified ASTATS. So there's an ASTATS plugin in traffic server. Every eight seconds, we pull that. And we get you know, some system statistics, but all, also all of the traffic server st statistics. We sort of get that into a server, and that server assesses health of all of these caches. Um, we have a, um, which, am I on the right one? Yes. We have a management and monitoring system that we built in-house. And like I said, I like to um, solve every problem there is in Perl. So we built that on Perl Modulicious. It's a framework, a web framework like anything, but we had a bunch of sysadmins, and it really helped us out doing that in, uh, in Perl and Modulicious. Um, and we actually bought a reporting system, because if you look at the first three rules that we have, no vendor lock-in, this allowed us to just keep moving, log files, you can't get locked into any vendor. We figured, let's just not worry about that. We already had some licenses with a vendor. We bought Splunk to do our log analysis. Um, a little bit about content routing. Um, 
and again, I, I think that's a term that we use and every, every, you know, to us it's kind of like normal what that is, but I, I really want to sort of go into a little bit layer deeper as to what that really means. Um, you want to get your customer to the best cash based on distance, network cost, network link quality and speed, and also availability of content. And there's two ways that you can do that. The first way is DNS content routing. And that really means that your content router is going to be DNS authoritative for the domain that you want to go to. So here, um, I'll just go through this. Here, we have edge.img.x.comcast.net. And what happens is your client is going to want to resolve that name to an IP address. So it's going to go to its local DNS server or resolver. And that local DNS server or resolver is going to be going to the .net or the .com, or, and it's going to go and, and eventually end up at us. So it's doing that query, and then it comes up at our content router, and that's where we make the routing decision. But because this is DNS, we only have two facts here. We know which resolver this client was using, and we know the health of our CDN because we sort of have this rascal server telling us that. I'll go do a little bit more of that as well. We actually don't know where the client is at this point. And if you at home set your resolver in your, in your uh, um, network settings, if you set it to Google DNS, then our CDN can't really know where you are for this type of stuff because Google DNS, anybody can set that. And really, it's hard to target people to a close web location for that. So. Um, we, we make the decision based on you know, this, this DNS resolver, and we send you to the most local cache. And we have these cache groups. And over here, I have Denver, and I have another edge. We have about 26 of these cache groups. I'm, I'm not calling them clusters, and I really don't want to call them clusters because we don't use the ATS clustering feature. But we do try and make those caches work together as one cache. But for DNS, we can't really do that much with that because we don't really know that this customer wants to get img.png. We just know that that customer wants to go to that host. We don't know what he's actually going to be getting. But anyway, we're going to make that decision as best as we can at that point, and we're going to send that customer to one of the caches over here. We, we gave him the IP address of edge 03, which is 1.2.3, whatever. And then, basically, we have a two-tier uh, system where we also have a mid-tier over here, and we at that point, make a content routing decision inside the cache. In parent selection, we did a modified parent selection um, algorithm where we do a hash on the, um, uh, the, the, the img.png in this case, and we send everybody that needs to get img.png because there's many of these edge, edge groups pointing at that one mid. It's, it's a hierarchy, right? So um, there's, there's many of them going that way. And, and we make that decision based on the content itself then. Um, we have 26 of these edge locations currently. We have three of these mid locations. It goes to the origin. Our edges are reverse proxies. Our mids are forward proxies. And that's sort of how the ATS, um, um, how the ATS parent selection, how, how that works, right? It, it needs a, for, a forward proxy there. These mids here are protected by two kinds of um, ACLs. Um, one is application layer ACL and IP allow.config. The other is a net network ACL. Because we found very fast that you don't want to have open forward proxies on the internet. There's like all kinds of interesting things that will happen to your CDN if you do, the, if you do that. So, so we don't do that. So um, the request goes to the origin. We, we assume it's all misses. And we see. This request go back 200, OK, 200, OK, caching, everybody happy. There are problems with this DNS, though, because the next time somebody wants that img.png, I actually don't know to send him to edge.03. I don't, because I don't know that he wanted that in the first place. So I can only sort of have people who are going to that host name congregating on a group of caches. But I don't really know what they have. Another way of doing this is 
um, by doing HTTP content routing. The first DNS, what you want to do, you usually want to do that when you're giving people objects for web pages and things like that. So you want to just really quickly get small objects. But as I said before, these video things, two, two, two seconds of video is easily a megabyte. So our objects in our caches are actually quite large. And what happens when somebody starts one of these video streams, they actually make a keep alive session to this cache and they stick to the cache. So what we do here is we actually, this, the, it's the same deal, but right at this point, the content router is not going to return the IP address of a cache, but it's going to return the IP address of itself. The client will then make a connection to the content router thinking it's going to get the content there. And at that point, the content router can make the decision to route this based on four things. It can look at the HTTP headers. It can look at the path. It can look at um, the health and the client location. And it really knows the client location now because it's the other side of the socket. And we know in our network where customers are because we manage our own network. So now the client can make a much better decision as to where to send this particular customer. And it can sort of um, use these edges, edge one, two, three, four, all in Denver. It can use, even though they're not clustered, it can use them as, as a clustered group of caches because every time somebody's going to get m1.f4m, we're going to send them to, I don't know where we're going to send them to, Edge 03 again. If somebody else is going to that same movie, they're going to go to that same cache. I'm not, I won't have that movie in any other cache than Edge 03 until it fails or the health protocol kicks in or something like that. Um, so I, I now have a much more efficient way to use my caches. They're still stateless. They don't know about each other. One doesn't know about the other. If one fails, we, we round around it. It's, um, we actually use consistent hashing to do that. And we do the same thing uh, going from our edge to the mid. So we do a consistent hash there again. Um, so content comes back. And here we go. Yes. How do you deal with the Game of Thrones? So every, that's one night in the new episode of Thrones, everyone's watching the same movie. Yes. So, the is going to keep over at that point. No. So what happens is, um, sorry, what's that? Oh, yeah. What happens, uh, thank you. <laughs> what happens when, uh, with Game of Thrones, and it's actually a really good example because it happened last Sunday. Game of Thrones came out, and I'm going to show you some numbers later. Those numbers are from last Sunday because that's where we had our, our highest traffic and all that stuff. So what happens is it'll stick on um, Edge 03, right? If I, can I go back? I can, I think. Yeah, look at that. So it'll stick on Edge 03, but we have this rascal server, this health protocol server sitting there every eight seconds asking it, hey, what are you doing? Hey, what are you doing? Are you doing okay? Are you doing okay? At Eight and a half gigabits per second on our 10 gigabit per second box, our rascal server is going to say, don't send any more traffic to this guy. All connections are going to be fine. All customers on that cache are going to be fine. But the next request that comes in, we're going to do consistent hash excluding Denver 03. So now we're going to go to another cache. And that's how the health pro we call it the health protocol kicks in. It basically is going to smear it out if there is. Because yeah, you're going to get hotspots but you're also gonna get really high cache hit ratio on that hotspot, right? That's, that's the sort of the balance you wanna strike. Does that answer? Any other questions? Um, okay, so why traffic server? Um, in all reality, any HTTP 1.1 caching server will work. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we sort of disqualified NGINX. There's a, there's a lot of problems with them and caching that we, we didn't want to go into. They're fast, but they're not compliant is what we found. And, and also, we sort of made this decision two years ago. So it's, there's, there's a little bit, you know, we're sort of invested in traffic server now. And we're not every month reevaluating is quit better this now. We're sort of invested in traffic server. Um, we looked at... Um, a lot at Varnish, actually, and this was because of some, some, legacy, um, some, some legacy work that was done. We were handed Varnish as, you know, try that. It, it looks really good. And it does look really good, but it does not work 
when you actually have to start writing to disk. It just completely, we tried all kinds of things to make it work, but we couldn't really make it scale. Um, also, we, um, we, um, we, we found that traffic server is, um, I don't, the performance out of the gate, I'll get into that a little bit more, was, was actually really, really impressive compared to other products. We didn't look at um, Squid that much because I, I think we all kind of felt like it had a lot of legacy, a lot of stuff that we didn't want to want to deal with at that time. Um, it it worked out of the box really really good with our uh, with our VOD load, uh, the the API uh, plugins we use some plugins so that works really well for us. And another thing, Apache and the community of Traffic Server. I I, I can't sort of stress that enough. I think, but the Traffic Server community is a very open, welcoming community. It's you can just go on IRC, ask a question, and you don't get your head bit off. You don't get somebody who wants to show you that they know better than this or better than that. It's just a really good community to work with. You could, we, we were accepted pretty much from the beginning as somebody who wants to use this, wants to help out, and, and you know, it really is sort of working out for us. I, I think that's, that's an important part of it. Um, we use maybe a handful of plugins for very specific use cases, nothing, nothing fancy. Our generation one cache is um, off the shelf hardware. And yeah, that seems really logical to everybody who's sitting here. But again, think about my world, right? I'm a cable guy. What we get is we get off the shelf hardware. Some vendor puts a bezel on front of it and his logo on top of it, marks it up 10 times, and they call it a product, right? That's the world we came from. So we really wanted off the shelf hardware important. We went with spinning disk. A lot of people are. Kind of like, why do you do that? Archer would tell me that you know, you don't you don't have a life if you're not on SSD, right? But for us, the load that we have and, and the way that traffic server sort of manages that load over these disks, it really is working out for us. And we came from a vendor managed product that had an exceedingly high failure rate on SSDs. We will be looking at SSDs soon, but our first were 900 gig um, SAS drives. Um, this thing has um, all these drives up front, though. It's, it's about two, 22 terabyte of, um, of caching in, in 2RU that we use. We use all the memory we can get because we have two really competing loads on this box. Um, one of them is video on demand. It's, you know, it's, it's a fairly long tail, as we call it. it it's, it's very spread out. Everybody's watching something else. It's, it's really sort of, you know, you want to have that spread across many caches. Your cache hit ratio is not going to be that high. And we have linear TV or live TV where everybody's sort of getting the same thing in the same minute. Um, we, um, we use memory for that live TV. Um, we use um, 10 gigabit Ethernet connectivity. Um, we are planning to upgrade our boxes to 20 gig E. Um, and we were the first cache to go into what we call our aggregation, uh, or first application to go in what we call our aggregation location. This used to be a domain of network engineers, you know, a million dollar router over here, another million dollar router over here, hundreds of gigabits per second between the two, and they would not hook up routers to that, or, or servers to that. that. That was just not done. We were the first one that actually hooked in at that place, and it was, you know, a learning experience for them as well. Um, it, it really is sort of fairly close to what, what, what our network is. A little bit about traffic server performance. Um, um, Brian was talking about that earlier. We, um, our, our load is very, very different. It's almost the opposite of doing 8K blocks, you know, at, at requests. It's almost the opposite, right? Our average object size is a meg, a little bit more maybe, a little bit less maybe, depending on what kind of thing we uh, do. But it tested really, really well. We were pushing 10 gigabits per second with our load um, from almost the get-go. I don't think we did any tweaking to get there, I think, right? So it, it, it tested very well. When you get into, if you don't do anything special, when you get into, uh, when you start hooking up to 20 gig or 40 gig, we were seeing fairly high Unix, lo Unix load at like 15 gigabits per second. And I'm kind of an old guy. If I see a Unix load over 30, I go like, ah, oh, that's not right. You got to do something. This is, you know, it's very freaky. I guess these new servers, they can do a lot. I've seen them go to 150, and they still, 
seem to be performing. It's, it's very, very crazy, but I don't, I don't like when that's happening. So one of the things, um, one, of, one of the first contributions that I think came from Comcast was um, the volume patch, we call it. It, it was something what, that allowed us to use RAM drives and have some traffic, our linear or live TV, go to that RAM drive, and other traffic, our VOD and all the other scavenger stuff that's on the CDN, go to the drives. And that really helped us. We've been able to test up to 40 gigabits per second with realistic traffic. And, and we actually, uh, we built our own tools to do this testing. We couldn't really find a lot of tools that would help us do the testing that we needed. So again, you know, hacked up a bunch of Perl, got an origin server that'll serve fake video fragments, and we're doing a lot of load testing with our own tools on this. Um, I, I don't know that we want to push it a lot farther beyond the 40 gigabits per second. Um, there, there's, there's all, there's, if you have three or four caches of these sizes doing 30, each is doing 30 gigabits per second, if that location failed, all of a sudden you got the, the, that many customers that now need to route somewhere else. That's a lot of work and, and we don't want to, we don't want to do that. So. Um, a little bit about open source and support. Um, you know, cable companies traditionally don't do this, especially two years ago. Um, and I remember Mark saying, what am I going to do? Am I going to call you when it breaks? <laughs> right? There were discussions about us getting pagers, all kinds of other things. Yes, it is scary to not have a support number, but there are support options. On the, is one of them. There's, there's, there's support options for people who want that. Um, there, it's often more FUD than actual real, you know, something that, that became real. In the two years that we've been doing this, I think we haven't had anything really blow up in our face. I think it's been quite calm and, and you know, knock on wood. I think we're doing okay on that. And also, if you have the source code and you have the people that are working on this source code, maybe even working on your team, then if you have a problem, you can make a surgical patch that fixes your problem, deploy it on your system, while a vendor is probably still testing it for the Korean language or for this or for that, right? We can really just look at what our problems are, fix that, and move on. And then later you can work around getting it upstream, getting it back into mainline, all that stuff, but we've really been sort of successful at that. Um, our status. Um, on, a, on an average day, we serve 1.5 petabyte out of this CDN. On Sunday, we did about two petabytes when Game of Thrones came out. Um, we have uh, over 250 of these caches deployed currently, and that adds up to about five petabyte of storage that we have. So this is why when traffic server decides, you know, we're going to change the cache format and you're going to have to rewarm all your caches, that's a big deal for us. That's a lot of stuff that we need to fill, right? That, that's, that's big. Um, we are currently doing um, single giggies, uh, but we are going to uh, the second giggie. Um, we have about 25 of these cache groups that are going deeper and deeper into our network. Um, we have a total of 1.7 terabits per second capacity, but our highest peak it has been about 360 gigabits per second. So when you have that hockey stick curve, we're still at the part where the ball, where we hit the ball with a, with a hockey stick. We are really, really planning on going way bigger than wh where we are now. The, the X1 interface, the newer set-top boxes, we are gonna have set-top boxes in people's homes that are gonna be pulling these ABR things straight from our CDN that never actually get into this old legacy cable qualm world. Um, we have three mid-tier cache groups. Our origin offload is actually probably higher than 90% right now, especially because we're still in that lower curve. Everything is IPv6, um, and that means that the client decides if he's gonna do IPv6 or IPv4. And he does that by DNS. A client, if a client does DNS, he will usually do both a, a request and a quad A request if the client has IPv6 connectivity, and he got a response on his quad A request, we will, he will just go to that host name, but he will use IPv6. About 8% of the traffic on our CDN is currently uh, IPv6. We hope by the end of this year it's gonna be in the 30 range. 
And the cool thing about that is it's not geeks like you guys that are getting IPv6. It's grandma, grandpa, they don't even know it, they're just getting IPv6. Yeah? So I think in the previous slide you talked about getting 40 gigabytes and you get a good amount of server, but if each one has that is the last, uh, last setup. Yeah, that's, 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 that's testing. Yeah, LACP or LACP. Our plans, um, so we want to double the size of this CDN this year. So, you know, where we were this year, the numbers are pretty big. We're going to even double it this year. We already have the orders and we're just doing it. We're rolling it out. We're adding a lot of these first screen experiences onto the CDN. This is sort of a lockstep between, you know, our, the, the, the group that does the engineering on that new interface and new set-top boxes and IP set-top boxes and us and the CMTSs and our infrastructure. Everything sort of has to roll into the same, um, you know, up the same hill, but we're, but we're trying to stay ahead of that curve. I, th I think we are and we will be. We're going to be looking at a new mid-tier cache, um, and this is, a, this is a super micro box that we're looking at. It's, John, keep me honest, it's 4RU, it's got 72 drives, and each of those drives is 4 terabytes, so it's 288 terabyte in 4RU. It's, it's amazing that you can even do that type of stuff, and we're going to be using those as mid-tiers because our mid-tier cache rate ratio is a little bit lower, and we want to sort of protect our origins a little bit better. We're also going to look at a next-generation edge um, where... I think we're going to probably end up with two different types of boxes. One box that's really sort of going to be focusing on linear or live TV. We are going to have hundreds of thousands of connections to that box. There's going to be lots of people getting really, really hot content that's going to be on SSDs or maybe even all of it in RAM. I don't, I don't even know that. The other box is going to be for our VOD that's going to probably have more drive and, and more things. And we're sort of going to content route to the right places on that. We're going to go um, deeper into our network. Currently, we're, we're fairly deep, but we want, we're probably going to end up at um, Comcast has, I think, 650 hub sites that we call them, you know, places where we do local ad insertion and, you know, local where we generate local TV. We're probably going to almost go into all of those in the next couple of years. Um, and we want to keep building tools for our operations. Our group is a DevOps group, so we have you know, people, dev, development and ops are really, really close to each other, and we, we want to keep sort of uh, moving forward with that. Um, here's my, uh, my traffic server wish list. Restarts are hard for us because these customers, they're stuck on that cache, right? They got content routed to that one cache. They're basically sitting there, and some people have CNN on all day. So how am I going to restart that cache? It's really hard for us to be restarting caches. Um, we need to be able somehow <laughs> figure out, and we're going to help. I mean, we got, we got Phil is, is working on it right now. We need to be able to figure out how we can make these caches run and restart them and get new plugins in them and get all new config on them, basically in a, in, in a way that they keep serving customers as well. So we do have provisions in the client that if they, if they crash, they all go to the content router. The, the, the content router then knows that that cache has crashed, and it will send it to another one. But we don't want to use that as a normal. Uh, like what? It's, yeah, it's, it, it all gets pretty complicated. For, we, we, the, the, one, of the, one of the things that, that I like about what we did is that it's very, very simple, and even I understand it. Those type of solutions always get me confused. You know what I mean? It's, it's, they, they, I, I, we really want to keep it stateless, simple, just go that route. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But its cache wouldn't be warmed, and there's all kinds of other issues with that, right? Well, so, I guess, I guess the other option is that someone just has CNN, right? I mean, 
No, no, no. So we, we will reroute them, but we will basically do that with our content router. It, it, it's, it's, the, it's the same way, but, but we don't like doing that because all of a sudden you've got to warm that cache and do all kinds of other stuff. Um, so stability, we had some problems with stability just after our 4X upgrade. Um, and it was mostly, I think, because we had our budget for memory too tight, but it was, it was kind of messy having a lot of caches for a while there. It's much better now, uh, but stability is, is really important to us. People are going to be using traffic server when they're watching their main screen, when they're at home sitting. And it's different, and I, I, you know, don't, no disrespect, but if you're going to Yahoo or, you know, the, the, people sort of expect internet sites or the internet, oh yeah, well, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, right? It's not completely like that, but you're more forgiving on an internet website than you are when you're watching the Super Bowl on TV. You don't want that to go down. And we need to get to the point where we can have traffic server running the Super Bowl for us, and nobody would be worried about it. Um, another thing, configuration flexibility. VCL is, you know, we use Varnish as a layer seven load balancer because it is so flexible and you can do so much in VCL with it. Something like that would be really nice inside traffic server. Um, and I think with that, I'm gonna open it up for questions because there's like five minutes, we're almost at lunch, yes. It depends a little bit, and it's, it's one of the things that we can tweak. But um, even if you're watching broadcast TV on your legacy set-top box with Qualm, we do tricks to that video a little bit. It's not actually as live as you think it is, maybe, because we got to do ad splicing and things like that. The short answer is, oh, I should have said, what's the buffer? He was asking, what's the buffer? What's the time? The short answer is about eight seconds. Right, Neil? <laughs> we can tweak it. Other questions? Why aren't you using the buffer mode? Um, because um, one of these cache groups is actually not in one location. It's so we, the Denver cache group is 12 or so of these caches. And um, six of them on, are in Aurora, and six of them are in Mile High, I think, the, the head end uh, right next to the stadium. Um, and you need, they, they almost assume like you have a local LAN doing this clustering stuff with multicast and all kinds of other stuff. That we, we just didn't want to go there. And the clustering also is a complexity and a state that we sort of really didn't want to go to. Yeah, it's, yeah. But it, it solves the DNS routing problem, though. It, it does solve that. We're sort of stuck with not having a good solution there, so it solves that. But Yeah. Yes? Uh, the question is, um, you've mentioned testing tools and um, any plans to open source it. I have great plans to open source all of this, but I need to, I need to convince my management of doing that. Um, and I, I'm actually getting some traction on that. Um, do we wanna, we'd love to open source um, the, the control plane, the, C, the content router, the health protocol, and the tools that we wrote to, uh, to do the testing. Because we actually have Perl video clients that behave exactly like these video clients, HLS, HDS, Smooth. They're written in Perl, they don't care about the video, but you can really, really scale them up and do testing on these caches. Yeah, we wanna do that. Um, I'm trying to convince my management that that's a good thing. Other questions, yes? Where do you find your bottleneck? Yep. Yeah, right? I, and we can get these 24 drives are pretty much running at almost between 95 and 100% utilization in, in whatever magic tools John uses. It's very evenly, yeah. John? Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, 
I don't know that we did that, but the question was, did we do any kernel tuning or, um, or, or changes to the kernel? We definitely didn't change the kernel. We have some settings. I think they're, they're, uh, they're called the swoop settings <laughs> that we put in there. <laughs> because you had like a list of things that you changed. I think we used some of them, not all of them. But most of it is, um, most of it is out of the box Linux. Other questions? What? Yes, sir. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. So one, one, and and I don't even. I shouldn't be explaining this because I I barely know what they found. But we we had this one problem not too long ago where um, traffic server would. It almost seemed like we had a, a a cache doing just fine, serving you know any cache that we have is doing thousands of requests per second. And some of them at random intervals would just seize up, like <gasps> not do anything for up to maybe 16, 17, 18, 20 seconds. They would just not do anything. Did a lot of debugging, um, browsing. LinkedIn had a really good um, blog post on, on this. And it turned out that we have these, and again, I don't know what I'm talking about, but we have these, um, these NUMA processors, and you have um, basically near memory and far memory. And if the kernel gets into a state where there's a really big imbalance between the near memory and the far memory and the cores that are using that, it's going to rebalance that. And that rebalancing actually made our caches not serve traffic for dozens of seconds. We were really, really surprised about that. So we turned that one off, not recently. That was a big change we made in, in, the, in the system parameters. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir? Um, it's a good question. It would, the question was, um, we didn't reevaluate tra our choice of traffic server. If, if we were to do it now, would we do anything different? I don't think so. I think, I think the best thing we did is we built our own tools to test our own load, because it really feels like because we did that, we know what our load is, and we've been We've proven that when we test something in the lab, and we, we, we're lucky we have a really nice lab, we can do these things where we go up to 40 gigabits per second on one box, and you know those type of things. We have the client simulators to do all that. But writing it yourself really helps you understand what kind of load you're putting on it, and, and we've proven that if, if we test it in the, in the lab, actually it works like that in the field, pretty close at least. So I don't think we, we would change a lot, no. All right, thank you very much.